Father, you are the one that we appraise, that we adore, that we worship this morning. And I pray that you will increasingly give us a hunger to know you, a hunger to experience what you would have us to experience, a hunger to uh, know your word, to, to, to see yourself revealed to us, and then, Father, to see yourself revealed in us as we walk in obedience to you. We sit at your feet this morning. Speak to us. It is in your name I pray. Amen. In 1964, I was just four years old, but this man became well known for an unusual reason. The Minnesota Vikings were playing a game, a football game in the NFL against the 49ers. Their front line, defensive line, was known as the Purple People Eaters. I don't know if any of you guys are old enough to remember those guys or not. Jim Marshall was one of those guys, and in, in a play, the, uh, the ball was fumbled, and Jim Marshall scoops up the fumble and heads toward the end zone. Amazingly, the opposite team let him go. It wasn't until after he had gotten in the end zone, celebrated his victory, and thrown the ball out of bounds that he began to realize he ran toward the wrong goal. In one of the most, this is NFL, nationally, na, you know, National Football League, well-known, well-reported, on, well-viewed. Uh, now, they were able to pull out a win anyway, 27-22, to 22, but not only did he run to the wrong goal, when he threw the ball out of bounds, he gave the opposing team a touchback and actually scored them points. Now, I have, I have, I have made some pretty bad mistakes, and I have made some pretty bad mistakes on some fairly public forums. Anytime that you stand up before people, it's easy to do so and to be held accountable to those. But I can't imagine what that would be like to get to the end zone and then, well, I can't imagine, at least to some extent, to get to the end zone and then realize, hey, I, 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 I was heading the wrong direction. This morning, as we look into God's Word, we're going to take a few minutes to continue our study in the book of Colossians. I would encourage you to uh, Open it on your app or open your Bible. We'll read the text together. But we're, we're studying about how to pray, a call to prayer, and how to pray for others. And one of the things that we noticed over the last two weeks is that Paul is praying for these people, the, the Christians that are gathered in the church at Colossae, that they would experience the things that he knows, that they would know what he knows, they would learn the things that he has learned, that they would know God and have spiritual help like he does. And so he intercedes for them. I would, I desire, I believe that God desires for our church to be filled with prayer warriors. People who are joined together in Christ Jesus. A people, his people. Uh, now we will be uh, distinct in our personalities and in our experience. We'll have varying pas uh, passions and perspectives. But we will be united in Christ Jesus. Jesus, united because he saved us, he's called us, he's made us his own, and he reveals to us the knowledge of his will in all spiritual understanding. When we become a church that is interceding, actively praying and lifting each other up, actively living in the relationships that God calls us to live into, then there's no one left to struggle alone. There's no one left to strive in isolation. Have you ever been where you felt completely disconnected from everybody else? And you may have been in a crowd when you experienced this. But I mean where you just felt like there's, I'm, I'm in this all alone. Years ago, I, I completed my studies at Furman and went off to seminary in Memphis, Tennessee. And I knew very few people in Memphis, Tennessee. And the people that I knew were acquaintances, some friends, but I had no family there, nobody I felt a real connection to. I was taking classes full-time. I had to work full-time as well, so I would take classes during the day, and I would work third shift uh, at night, and I would have to study in between. I didn't do great, by the way. I'll just go ahead and confess that right now. But I remember uh, coming to the end of that first semester and uh, was not going to be able to come home for the holidays. And I remember sitting in my little apartment, feeling incredibly sorry for myself, all alone. And the, the struggles, the stresses, 
the, the, the pressure is what I wouldn't have given for just a phone call or a connection that would have been meaningful. Have you ever felt alone? You know what I'm talking about? Many of you can relate to this. It's, it's often it's in the dark watches of the night or it's in the evening or it can be at other times when you just feel isolated. Do you understand that in the Christian life, God has designed us and knit us together and placed us in a body and in a family so that there's always family? so that we have the presence of the Holy Spirit, just like the psalmist. By the way, if you're in that place now, I would encourage you to pick up and read our daily Bible reading, Psalm 41, Psalm 42, Psalm 43, that's today's, and Psalm 44. The psalmist is crying out to God, saying, I'm isolated, or I'm struggling, or I need you. And, he, and, and you see how God responds, and how the psalmist turns his mind and his heart to God. And so when we have Christ, we have enough. But aren't you glad that God puts other people in our life? And one of the ways that we connect with others is, is by going to the throne of grace, talking to God, interceding on their behalf. Imagine each of us seeing our lives as a part of God's work in the world. Not that Christianity is just a Sunday activity or something that we add on to our career or add on to our family or add on when we think about it but a daily way of living where we walk worthy of the Lord, where we live in connectedness with Him, living the Christian life as God instructs and desires for each of us. Even as we saw last week, to consistently and increasingly live the Christian life, it requires two things. It requires, first of all, the integrity of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't live the Christian life without being related to Him, without being yielded to Him, without being saved, without being connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it requires further the knowledge of His will, and we saw that that's revealed in His Word. So there's a commitment to knowing the Word of God, but also to obeying the Word of God. And so that's where we start, to live the Christian life, to be intentionally praying for others, to make sure it's our own experience, we first of all have to know that we know Him. And I don't mean that we signed up for church or that our parents were Christians or, or that we've had some sort of uh, experience. What I mean is that you come to the place where the Holy Spirit made you aware that you were separated from God by sin and that one day you're going to have to stand before the Creator of the universe. One day this life is going to run out. And it may be quick, it may be soon, you never know when. But one day you're going to have to stand before God. And the Bible very clearly says your sins have separated between you and your God and the wages of sin is death. And so you've come to this awareness, this conviction that the Holy Spirit brings. You come to this awareness and then the Holy Spirit enlightens you to understand through God's word, through the testimony of his people, that God has made a way so that you can be right with him, so that you don't have to face the penalty of your consequences because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his name is Jesus, that whosoever believes in him, entrusts their life to him, will not perish, but will have everlasting life. And so recognizing that I'm guilty before God, Christ, God has made a way in Christ Jesus for me to be saved. I respond in repentance and faith, and God makes me new. He saves me. He makes me into something I've never been before. And that is a relationship with Christ. The Bible calls it being born again. The Bible calls it being saved. And so that's where you can't, you can't obviously, you can't live the Christian life if Christ is not in your life. That's kind of a, a no-brainer. But it's important to recognize this. And then... The desire to be obedient. I long to be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. Now, we have repeated that verse over the last three Sundays. So i got a question for you. Have you resolved to walk worthy of the Lord this week? Last week? Week before last? How's it going? Is your life... Remember one of the points of last week's sermon? Let others see Jesus in you. Started out this week, and I, boy, it started, it started out good. I had prayer time Monday morning, and I said, all right, Father, I want you to be glorified in me today. The things that I teach and preach, I want to make practice in my life consistently on an ongoing basis. I want you to be glorified in me today. How long do you think it was before something happened <laughs> that, uh, and I'm not going to tell you what it was, <laughs> but, but but that my response was not a response that gave glory 
to God. I, I will tell you that it is possible to live the Christian life. Sometimes we think we just can't, but it is possible to live a Christian life in a way that glorifies God. And that's what we're studying this morning. This is what I want me to know. It's what I want you to know, but it's also what I want us to be praying for one another. I want you to be praying more than so-and-so will feel better. I want you to pray that God will be glorified in their life today and this week. Now, when we have a relationship with God and we have a commitment to know His will and obey it, we good there, right? A relationship with God first. I've got to know God. and got to know Jesus Christ, be indwelled by this Holy Spirit. Got to know God. Second, have to be committed to, to His Word, to His will. Uh, Paul prayed that you may know, you may have, you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual understanding. So I know His will, and I'm, I'm committed to obey it. Then all of a sudden, some things just kind of happen. It, it is a happening that God promises. It's the difference between a verb and a participle. It's the difference between a command and a consequence. And so that's when we go back through our text. And we're going to do a little bit of deep reading. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've given you three points on your outline. I'm hoping to make it through the first one. All right? So, so if you're one of those who has to have your blanks filled in, I will apologize. My wife is shaking her head already. She has told me repeatedly, if you're not going to fill in the blanks, don't put the blanks on the paper. All right? But, but I'm, going, I'm, going to, I'm going to try. I'll at least give you the words to fill in the blank. But as I've gotten into this study, I just want to, want to talk to you. Because, you know, this is daily living. Sometimes when we preach and teach and you get these kind of broad theological things, uh, statements about living in all spiritual wisdom, and then this happens and that happens, and it's like, all right, how does that apply to this? I want to make sure that we have this very clear understanding of how God is glorified in us as we walk in obedience to Him. So my desire is first to know Him, second to know His will and obey it. And as I do that, as I'm living in a healthy relationship with Him, then there are some things that naturally come out. So let's look at the text. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, we'll start in verse 9. So, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be, here's our verse, filled with, with the knowledge of His will, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Why? It's not enough to know it. Then you get to obey. So as to walk, to live, in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. There's our goal. If your goal is anything else, you're heading to the wrong end zone. We're to be driven and to be filled with the desire to be fully pleasing to Him. Now, we come to participles. We're not going to make it all the way through this prayer. We're going to stop at this verse. Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So there's verse 10. Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Those are participles. Those are not commands. The command is not you go bear fruit. You get that, right? The command is not you go bear fruit. The command is, is that we abide in Him that we seek Him, that we have a relationship with Him and we pursue the depth of that relationship, that we be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual understanding. And then what happens is we have good works that produce fruit. Now, I want us to understand good works. The first point on your outline is that you are to, we are to, we are to pray that others trust Jesus to produce fruit in my life. That we trust Jesus to produce fruit in my life. Good works that bear fruit are the natural result of being in a right relationship with God. As I am filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual understanding, and as I walk in obedience to that will, good works that result, that bear fruit, are, are, is, is what flows out of me. It's, Jesus described it another way when he was preparing for his departure to his disciples in John chapter 15. In John 15, we're going to read several verses. We'll start at verse 1 and go down through verse 5. You will be aware that this is the, 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 the discourse, his instruction to his disciples as he's getting ready to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And from the Garden of Gethsemane, he is taken by the Roman soldiers, he's tried, and he's crucified. So he's preparing them for what's coming next. John chapter 15, we're going to read verses 1 through 5. Make a note of that on your outline. Jesus says to them, I am the true vine, 
And my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I've spoken to you. You're already mine. There's already no condemnation. You're already saved. You're already washed. Already you're clean because of the word I've spoken to you. But now, verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So, here's the quiz. How hard does the vine have to strain to produce grapes? Or how hard does the branch have to strain to produce grapes? It doesn't have to strain at all. It's the natural consequence of being attached to the vine. It gets its life and its fruitfulness by, simply by virtue of abiding in in the vine so when we're talk when the bible talks about good works what we need to understand what good works are i have to tell you there's a lot of misunderstanding i believe about what good works actually are good works are those things that god has revealed that we are to do good works are those things that god reveals that bring glory to him and that make an eternal impact upon people's lives And the fruit of those good works are the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, and they are the fruit of the Holy Spirit working in other people's lives. Listen to what he said. Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, For apart from me, you can do nothing. All right, so rubber meets the road. What does it mean as a believer to do good works? It means day by day by day. We seek the will of God in every circumstance and in every relationship and in every experience, situation that we find ourselves in, and then we, by faith, do that. We obey what God would have us to do. And it, this, this has to do uh, when you're tired and when you're frustrated. This has to do when you're dealing with kids or when you're dealing with parents. This has to do when you're dealing with peers. This has to do when you're dealing with a, a workload. This has to do when you're dealing with a, a project on your house. Every, every circumstance of life. Father, what are those things that give glory to you? And, and the Bible's full of these. This, by the way, while we're speaking in terms here, Paul always, first of all, explains the theology, the truth about God and how we're to think and behave. And then he gets into behavior. The problem with starting with behavior is that we get into some sort of behavior modification and our hearts never change. You understand the difference? Our behavior is to flow out of our belief, is to flow out of that which is in us. You can control your actions. Trust me, you can Sometimes you may not feel like you can, but you can plan for and control your actions. But you cannot always control your reactions. What is it that determines your reactions? It's what's inside. It's your heart. I've said it before. I heard it a thousand times growing up. I'm just going to pass it on to you. What's in the well is what comes up in the bucket. If you drop a bucket in a well and it's got good water, good water is coming out. Jesus said it a different way. He said, from the heart flows. The source is the heart. And so when you and I talk about, all right, what does it mean to be a good Christian? It's more than just a list of behaviors. Now, are there right things to do? And are there things that we should not do? Are there prescriptions and instructions? Yes. And are there prohibitions? Thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Yes. But those are not done in the power of our flesh for our own good. Those are done in the power of the Holy Spirit as He continues to change us, to change our hearts, to conform us to the image of God. And so when we talk about good works, the, 
the Pharisees were freaked out by Jesus. All right, he came and he said things that nobody else had said to them. And he made claims that nobody else had, had, had made. And in John chapter 6, you can almost see them pulling their hair out. And they look at Jesus and says, what are the works of God? Tell us what to do so that we can do them. And Jesus answered with a very simple statement. This is the work of God. That you believe in him in whom he has sent. That you believe in me, the one that he has sent. And so behavior always flows out of our belief. It always flows out of our heart. The work that God does in our heart. So it is knowing the Lord's will, knowing how we're to speak, knowing what we're to think, knowing how we're to do, knowing what our work ethic is, knowing how we're to love our spouses, how we're to to raise our children, how we're to honor our parents. It is knowing all of those things as we study the Word of God and then walking in obedience. It is being willing to forgive when you don't want to forgive. It is willing to endure when you don't want to endure. It is willing to... To, to trust God and not worry, not live in anxiety. It is a willingness to stand in truth. When we know what God teaches, as we are connected to Him, He gives us the power to be able to do this. So what are good works? They're the result of knowing God's will and accomplished in God's power to God's glory. And here's one of the problems that we have, and this is why uh, it, it's hard sometimes We get so focused on the to-do list that we forget who we are in Christ Jesus. And we focus on our works and our behavior to the detriment of focusing on having a devotion to knowing God Himself. It is, uh, we we try to counterfeit fruitfulness in our life. We, We try to pretend. Paul Tripp gives an illustration in his book. He wrote a book called Instrument in the Redeemer's Hands, in which He likens our pursuit of change in our own lives and in the lives of others as unto heart change at the root of our lives, not simply artificially produced fruit for appearance sake. You get that now. We we can artificially produce fruit for different reasons, appearance sake. uh, We're not willing to have God do his work in our heart and our life for a variety of different reasons. And so we kind of act it out. We pretend. And here's what he writes. If a tree produces bad apples year after year, there is something drastically wrong with its system down to its very roots. I won't solve the problem by stapling new apples onto the branches. Can you imagine such a thing? In one of his parenting videos, he, he, he gets a little bit more personal in this illustration. He says, imagine I have an apple tree in the backyard and the apples grow, but they are just like hockey pucks, to use his word. They are shriveled and they're, they're just terrible And I decided, well, I've got to fix that. And so I go buy a bushel of golden apples, uh, ripe apples. And I go out in the backyard and I nail apples to the tree. From a distance, it looks great for a while. But when you get close, you can see that the tree's not bearing fruit. Those apples will not last. And next year... It will also, there will be no change in the system of the, of the tree. As a matter of fact, it will probably be worse because of the damage that has been taking place. So back to this, he says, They will rot because they are not attached to a life-giving root system. And next spring, I'll have the same problem again. I will not see a new crop of healthy apples because my solution has not gone to the heart of the problem. If the tree's root remain unchanged, it will never produce good apples so what are good works what are good works that the holy spirit produces in us that enables us to increasingly glorify god it is when we are filled with the knowledge of his will we submit to his will rather than me telling god what he needs to do in this circumstance or this situation we walk in obedience and as i am pursuing the knowledge of god i get to know god more Get to know God more fully, more deeply, and it becomes the fruit that He produces in my life. And so first, there are works that are false fruit, works done without the integrity of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 7. We have a startling uh, 
Sharon, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 17 through 23. We have a startling and, and in some ways terrifying illustration and teaching of the Lord Jesus. And he's talking about when false prophets come in or when there are people who are teaching things that are not true. This is uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount. And he talks about the difference between good fruit and bad fruit. And he begins by saying, so every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. And again, he's talking about false teachers in that context. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, what in the world does that mean? We'll see in just a moment. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. And then he goes right on and says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But who will? The one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Remember what we're praying, that we'll be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual understanding. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, what, what, what's he going to say to these people? By the way, is prophecy a good thing? Is casting out demons a good thing? Right. In, in another passage, if you get to later on in Matthew, Matthew chapter 25 and other passages where he deals with uh, giving people something to drink and, and clothing the naked, uh, taking care of the poor, uh, visiting those who are in prison. Right. Uh, are those good works? Those seem to be absolutely very good good things but what he says here to these who quote prophesied or cast out demons and did seemingly good mighty works in your name verse 23 then i will declare to them i never knew you depart from me you workers of lawlessness so the first the first basis uh, the, the, the first understanding is that good works are not always what we think are good works they're what god says good works are he gets to decide what those are. And they may be different than what we think. Good works are the will of God in every circumstance and in every situation. Now, are we supposed to take care of the orphan and the widow? Are we supposed to visit those in prison? Are we to care for the sick? Absolutely. Those are good, good things to do. But as we go through life, you can be engaged in things that the world would simply say, that's a good thing, that's a caring person. And they never have an impact on someone's spiritual life. They never have an impact on anything beyond the next week or the next month or the next year or the five years. They have no impact upon eternity. And so that's why we have to have this spiritual knowledge and spiritual understanding so we engage in those things obediently that God leads us to do so that there is an eternal impact, a spiritual impact. I am glad for organizations and for churches that do those things like feed the hungry and clothe the poor, that, that care for our world and make our world a better place. These are things that God calls us to do as a demonstration of His glory and a testimony of His witness to the world. We must do those things. Jesus told His disciples, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. But apart from a relationship with Christ, they have no spiritual or eternal value. And so we are always motivated by glorifying God in the things that God would have us to do. Now there's a second part of counterfeit fruit, or a second thing I want to I'll point out today. And, and these are, this is for believers. So if you're here and you've been saved, I want you to listen to this. You can do good things in the flesh. You can do Good things for the wrong reasons, apart from God's power, and it still be not identified as a good work. And, and let me see if I can illustrate this from one of Paul's writings in, in when he was writing to the church at Corinth. They were, they were having fights, man. Uh, they were arguing about who was the best preacher, and they were into cliques. There was all this conflict. He has just told them in, at the beginning of chapter 3 that he wishes he could take them to the next level of maturity, but it seems like they've just backed up and they're still babes. They should be further along than they are in their walk. And he says 
about the foundation that is laid when he's talking about different people doing different things. He says there's one foundation. The foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 11, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now he's talking about the workers. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, straw stubble, each one's work, work will become manifest will be shown and won't be concealed because the day will disclose it judgment day will know then because it will be either it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives he receives a reward if anyone's work is burned up he suffers loss though though he himself will be saved but only as through fire so let me let me talk about this just for a minute because i think it's important that we grasp that you can be a believer following after Christ and sign up and do good things and serve for God's glory, hoping that others will see that again as a motivation. But you can do it for the wrong reasons, and it becomes a good thing done in the flesh. And God's not glorified in it. Does that make sense? You can do a good thing in the flesh apart from the Spirit of God, and God not be glorified in it. You can do good things because you want the recognition. Because you're trying to win the approval of others. Because you are trying to win a conflict or to show them. You can do good things out of pride. You can do things, again, for recognition. You can do things motivated by guilt. To make up for all the bad things that you've done. You can do things, good things. And do good things in such a way. That the name of God is a reproach and criticized. Rather than the name of God is glorified. Now I'm sure that we all have examples of this. When I was pastoring the deaf church in Texas, we had a man who was deaf. Well, and I'll, I'll compare two of them. Uh, one man's name was Raul, and the other man's name was Emigdio. Both of these guys were deacons in the church. Emigdio loved the Lord, I'm just convinced. He was a, a good man, he loved the Lord, he walked with God, and he would serve, and he would drive a van he would prepare the place that we had to worship he would uh, lead and he was just he would do visitation he's just fully engaged and we had another guy um Raul, who 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 uh had an attitude problem <laughs> and if you compared their to-do list raul was always in competition with the mink deal if he did this i'm going to do it next week if he can do that i'm going to do it and he would drive the van sometimes. He would work on the building sometimes. He would serve in different ways sometimes. But he always brought contention. And he always brought this, you need to honor me. You need to recognize that I'm doing this. And he would always, most often, complain about what he was doing. I'm here to serve the Lord, and I hate it. Do you understand how... How ridiculous that is. Father, I thank you for the privilege of serving you in this ministry. But these people are just terrible. And it's hard. And it's, and you can, we know, we know. Anybody here not complain in the last week? Can I, can I tell you about bearing good fruit according to Scripture? We'll see in just a moment that when I am passionately pursuing Christ and I am committed to His Word, and I want Him to be glorified in me, and He shows me His will, and here's an opportunity for me to engage in physical, hands-on, goods work. You know what the consequence of that is in this passage of Scripture, later in this prayer? Joy. Joy. Yes, it can be hard. 
And yes, it can be difficult. And yes, it will be challenging. As a matter of fact, you can just guarantee it. Go ahead and write it, write it down. But our prayer is that as we are connected with Christ, as we're pursuing Him, as we're walking in obedience to Him, even in these circumstances, we can be filled with joy. And God's name is glorified. And people see our good works, and they glorify our Father in heaven. Because it is not a good work done in the flesh, it is a good work done in the Spirit. Does that make sense? Are you with me? I told you, point one. So what I want some of you to do is to stop straining trying to produce good works. And I want you to put all your energy and effort in focusing upon knowing Jesus better. And being close to Him. In reading His Word and praying in seeking to know his will in every circumstance and in every situation, that he may be glorified in you. Some of you aren't doing this or, or, or you're not engaged in those kind of good works at all just, just because you're disconnected from the source. You aren't abiding in the vine. And my prayer for you is that you will come to know that you need Jesus. You need to be dependent upon him. That there is no life or no hope apart from him. And that you will surrender your life to him totally and completely. And that's how we're born. And then it becomes that ongoing process of living day by day. Isn't God good? Can I tell you, you can trust Jesus to produce good works in you. You don't have to strain to do it. Isn't that good? You can trust Jesus to produce the right attitudes, the right thoughts, the right behaviors, the right actions. As you simply pursue Him. I want to close this sermon. By the way, you can keep your outline or we'll give you another one next week. But we've we got two more points to go. But, but, but I want to close this with an with a illustration given by Wayne Cordero, who is a pastor of a church in Hawaii. He also pastors a church and, and they've planted a church in Oregon. They've planted churches around the world. And he's telling a story at a conference about a trip that he recently took, this was several years ago, all right, this is not in the last couple of years, this is several years ago, about a trip that he took to China and his interaction with those leaders there. Let me finish with this uh, story. We go to China from time to time and, and uh, uh, we train leaders. And this time we brought up 22 leaders from the Hunan province and they rode 13 hours on a train to get to a hotel that they came up two by two in these elevators as, so as to not draw any attention. And then they got to a hotel room, a little apartment uh, room. It's only about 700 square feet in the little living room, no air conditioning, hardwood floor, 22 sat there. I came in and when you teach in China, you start at eight in the morning and you don't get done till five at night. You teach the whole day. They were sitting there, all 22 of them, and I looked around and I said, now, if we get caught, what will happen to me? They said, oh, you'll get deported in 24 hours and we'll go to prison for three years. I said, you're kidding. How many of you have been in prison for your faith? Out of 22, 18 raised their hands. I thought, no way. And I looked at them and I said, you, you 22 people, how many people do you oversee? Because they were all of these small group leaders, underground church leaders in the Hunan province. I said, how many, if you counted up all the people under your jurisdiction, how many would it be? And they counted them up and they said, a little over 20 million. I said, what? See, we forget there's 1.3 billion people in China. This is crazy. Well, I had 15 Bibles and I passed them out. Obviously, seven didn't get them. And I said, let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1 and we're going to read it. And just then, one lady handed hers to somebody next to her. And I thought, hmm, interesting. Well, we turned there anyway. And as we started reading it, I understood why she gave it away. She had memorized the whole thing. She just recited the whole chapter. When it was done, I went over to her at a break and I said, you, you, you recited the whole chapter. She says, oh yes, I've memorized many chapters. I said, where did you memorize many chapters? She said, in prison. <laughs> she said, you have much time in prison. <laughs> so I said, but don't they confiscate the Bible? She said, yes. So people bring in scriptures written on pieces of paper and they bring it in. 
So I said, but then if they find that piece of paper on you, won't they confiscate that? She said, oh yes, that's why you memorize it as fast as you can. Because <laughs> even though they can take the paper away, they can't take what's hidden in your heart. I thought, wow. Well, after three days, you fall in love with these people. And when it was done, I, I said, how can I pray for you? I'm going to go back to America. And you guys have been just so wonderful. How can I pray for you? They said, you know, Wayne, you guys can gather like this whenever you want to in America. We can't. Could you pray that one day we'll be just like you? And I looked at him and I said, I will not do that. Big incredulous eyes looked at me and they said, why? <laughs> I said, because you guys rode a train for 13 hours to get here. In my country, if you've got to drive more than an hour, people don't come. You sat on a wooden floor for three days. In my country, if people have to sit more than 40 minutes, they leave. You sat not only here for three days on a hard wooden floor, but you did it without air conditioning. In my country, if it's not padded pews and air conditioning, people don't often come back. In my country, we have an average of two Bibles per family. We don't read any of them. You hardly have any Bibles, and you memorize them from pieces of paper. I will not pray that we become like, uh, you become like us, but I will pray that we become just like you. And that's what I pray for us. That we will ask God to increase our devotion to Him. To knowing Him. To walking in obedience in Him. To Him increasingly being glorified in us. Isn't that great? God is so good. Father, thank you for the privilege that we have to trust you. To know you. To obey you. It is my prayer that our lives will be filled with good works. Those things that you lead us to do. Those things that... You then enable us to do as we trust you and as we obey you. I pray, Father, that you will increasingly be glorified in us this week and that we will, as a people, be continually and consistently lifting one another up in prayer, praying these things that we might see you work in miraculous ways. You are a mighty God. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.